This is Debt Free in 30, where every week we talk to industry experts about debt, money, and personal finance. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. What's it like to work for the biggest company in Canada, only to have it go out of business and leave you unemployed and looking for a new job at age 47? Northern Telecom Limited, more commonly known as Nortel, at the start of this century was so big it accounted for about one-third of the entire value of the Toronto Stock Exchange. It was worth almost $400 billion and had over 94,000 employees. By 2009, it was bankrupt, which at the time was the largest bankruptcy in Canadian history, and its pensioners, shareholders, and employees suffered enormous losses. Of course, Nortel isn't the only company to go bankrupt. Here we are in September 2017, and the bankruptcy of Sears, another company with a long history, is in the news, and I'm sure there will be many more big corporate bankruptcies in the future. This is a story that won't go away. What's it like to go through the largest corporate bankruptcy in Canadian history? What's it like to think you'll be working for the same company for your entire life, only to lose your job at the height of your working career? Those questions and a lot more with a man who lived through it today on Debt Free and 30. So let's get started. Who are you? So I'm Alan Witten, also known as the Big Cajun Man. The Big the Cajun big Man here Cajun in man. the house on the podcast. Oh, yeah. And we will talk a little bit more about uh, how people can find you. You have one of the the most read blogs out there in the blogosphere. But uh, why don't you take us back to what it was like and, you know, kind of give us the quick version of it. But what was it like at that time? So um, the actual day you found out. Well, so the day I, I actually knew three days beforehand because I looked in my calendar and saw a meeting with my boss that the wording was completely wrong and it was all in capital letters and I looked and there were a whole bunch of other of those meetings and I went, okay, so I've lived through 18 different layoff scares and we've learned important things about, you know, HR books, large blocks. And I went, oh crap, this looks like it's it for me. And it, it happened this time. And I mean, I, I after going through 18 of them, it was really surreal because I just sort of went, oh, well, this is weird. When you say going through 18 of them, you mean previous rounds of layoffs yep. or that, that you from survived? About, from 2001 on. In fact, one of the layoffs, they actually had our layoff packages sitting there. And then another group had decided, oh, no, we'll we'll take those people. And they took most of us over. So... It was so. It was a number of years. Oh yeah, of uncertainty. So when it finally happened, was it a shock or was it more of okay? Well, we knew this day was coming. It happened when it happens to anybody. I th- I think there's few people that go, oh yeah, no, I was fine. All that. I was sort of completely blurred, and I went and actually stopped on the way home at my church because my wife worked there and my minister was there, and he he was the one that sort of aligned everything, and he said. So I've known you for about nine years, and every time I talk to you, you're talking about how you're about to get laid off. So now it's happened. Can we move past that now? <laughs> and I went, Ooh. oh, yeah, okay. Well, I guess I'm no longer that sort of one-line one story. Yeah. yeah. About to get laid off. And it actually happened. And clearly your your life didn't end because you are here. You've since gone on to find other gainful employment and, and, and so on. Yeah. So it was... Widely expected, but was still a shock. Yep. And but it happened. So okay. So so let's say there are people listening to us today who are working maybe for a big company that's been successful in the past, and now things are, are are a little sketchier. Or maybe they're working for a small company. I mean, when you lose your job, you lose your job. It doesn't really matter if it was a big company, a small company, or whatnot. Yeah. In your case, you'd been there for a long time. Twenty years. Twenty years. So. I, you know, it was your home. It was, I mean, you know, oh, yeah, no, frankly, I'm, the only real job you'd ever had, I'm guessing, in an in in adult yeah. sense of the word, right? Mm-hmm. So what are the things you would tell someone who is either in that position or potentially would face it? And frankly, everybody listening to this will potentially face it because it's very rare these days that someone is at the same job or the same company doing the same work for more than a, a few years. So in a working life, things are going to happen, things are going to change. So so walk me through the kind of advice or the, the things people should be thinking about in that situation. Well, everyone is expendable. Everyone is expendable. No matter how you look at it, no matter how safe you think you are, 
anything can change in a company. I mean, Nortel, everybody thought, okay, you know, strange things are happening, but we're going to recover. We're going to recover. We're, we're such a huge part of, you know, the entire lexicon of Canada. Which you were. Telecommunications. We were, but it just goes to show how fast things can go into the toilet. So be careful. Be always ready. Have your resume needs to be within two to three months of wherever you are. You, and it needs to be up to date. And you need to be able to do that elevator talk with people and say, you know, be able to say in 20 seconds what's great about you and why they want to hire you. Because once you get laid off and you start trying to look for jobs, you'll find out there's a lot of people looking. And there's a lot of people a hell of a lot younger than you are looking for jobs. And I mean, a 47-year-old former programmer that's been doing project management, there's a lot of those out there. And it's it's hard to differentiate yourself. And so what was your 22nd elevator pitch? Oh, good God. Or what would it be today? Or what would be the, you know, a kind of thing you would put in something like that? I just, I my experience level is across the board. I've worked on different projects in the government now and at Nortel, telecommunications understanding, understanding of all, of many technologies. The breadth of my understanding was the major selling point I'd always have. Depending on who I'm talking to, I would talk specifically about their areas. It's it's interesting, though, because I'm just thinking in my mind, what would be my 20-second elevator pitch? And I don't know. haven't thought about it. Um, I could give you a pretty good 15-minute one. Right. Well, let me go on this rambling sojourn of my whole life. But 20 seconds? is that's really tight. That's that's tough to do. So, And I, I definitely like the idea of having a resume handy because, frankly, it's not that hard to do. Yep. You probably had to make one up when you got the job you're at. So go back on your computer, you know, and, and maybe it's once a year, every six months, on your birthday, on Canada Day. I don't know when you do it, but set yourself some kind of schedule. I guess the answer is every time something changes, you get a promotion, you, yeah. you change whatever. Get it updated so that if you were to get laid off tomorrow, no problem. I need 10 minutes to put, you know, end date, 2017, boom, resume's ready and out it can go. And the danger is if you've been at a company a long time, you get lazy. Mm -hmm. You go, well, you know, I don't need to have an updated resume. I've got a good job. I mean, I might need it to apply for an internal job. No, you need it. Yeah. And it needs to be out there too. Well, and even if you don't, ever need it for an external job presumably there's some kind of performance reviews salary reviews things that happen in a big company you might as well have the information at your fingertips so yeah understanding and remembering what you've done too Mm -hmm. like having using something like linkedin even having a resume there that you can start from is important and with linkedin it's out there everybody can see it so that's yeah but assuming that people can see it just because it's on LinkedIn isn't yeah. enough. I mean, they're, they're you've got to be networking. It. Yep. And I mean, if you think you're about to get laid off, you better start networking now. Yeah, or a year ago. Yeah. Because, I mean, everybody's everybody can be someone who can find you a job. Yeah. I mean, in my case, the job I ended up with in the government, I ran into a guy I used to work with at Nortel. And his daughter and my daughter were graduating from middle school. And I just saw him and said, he said, hey, how's it going? And I said, I might be looking for a job, and from that, that's how I ended up with the job. Yeah, you never know where it's going to come from. Exactly. So so no one is indispensable. Have a resume handy. Always be networking. Have your elevator pitch ready. That's pretty good because that was just, you know, one point that that I asked you for. Well, so so give me some other advice then from your your time going through this. Well, so uh, I go to church, and we had one guest minister one week who said, we were all three paychecks away from living on the streets. If you're, you know, even if you're not thinking you're going to lose your job, you need to go through your finances and go, what happens if I get laid off next week? What happens if I get laid off next week? And there's no severance because there's a lot of companies now that are not paying severance. They just disappear. They just disappear off the face of the earth and you don't get no more money. Mm -hmm. Can, you know, I have an emergency fund. Can your emergency fund withstand you if you're the only breadwinner? Deal with that. Yeah, and I disagree with your minister. It's less than three paychecks for most people, I'm guessing. Well, you're in the business, so I would say I would. Yeah, perhaps I'm skewed because of the, the people that we end up helping. But but you're right. It's a perfect thought experiment to do. So ask yourself that question. If tomorrow when I go to work or the next day I go to work, they say, oh, sorry, the company is, is no more. 
It's just shut down. That's it. It's done. What would you do the next day? Do you have money in the bank? You know, at the very least, you have a line of credit you could use to pay the rent. I mean, I, I hate to go into debt for something like that, but if you're already maxed out on all your debt, then you're, you're you've got no wiggle, wiggle room whatsoever. My so. wife's comment on that when I started pointing that one out to her, she said, "Emergency preparedness." Mm-hmm. And I mean, you you war games it. You you sit down with someone and you just maybe bounce it back and forth with them and just say, "Okay, you know, what can I do? What just have something in mind because." You know, you know better than I do. You're in the business. People are going to walk in off the street. I mean, I know people that have two incomes, and someone lost, you know, two of my incomes, so mm-hmm. two times my income level, who've ended up in pretty dire financial straits because one of them lost a job. Yeah, and part of that is because it's very difficult to downscale your expenses immediately. Because yeah. what are your big expenses? Well, I pay the mortgage or the rent. I pay for my car. Well, tomorrow, if I lose my job, I can't just get rid of my house in a day. I can't get rid of my car lease in a day. So, yeah, okay, maybe I don't eat out as often. That saves me a few bucks. But it's very hard to instantly downscale your life. And what if your kids are going off to school? Mm -hmm. And you said, oh, yeah, we're going to help you by, you know, we've got your RESPs here ready. And now you're looking at all this money and you're going, you know, I could really use that money instead of you getting an RESP and going off to school. Why don't you go get some OSAP and I'll take some of that money. Yeah, There's all of that. Like, and, and that was actually part of what happened with me was my oldest daughter was going off to university and my two younger daughters were, you know, in still in high school. And I've got a son who was three, two at the time. And we, you know, it was, it was sort of a really uh, perfect storm of, lousiness Mm -hmm. that happened because there was a health issue there was being laid off and then there was you know dealing with all of this and with the kids and all that and if you think oh yeah i'm going to be stoic and i'm going to no you're not yeah because this will take the legs out from everyone whether you want whether you think you're going to pull it off or not yeah because you just don't expect it to happen so okay so let's continue on with your with your uh, points then so um I mean, this sounds to me kind of like a putting all your eggs in one basket type of thing then. Yeah, you better get – in in my case with Nortel, I, I lost money. I didn't lose as much money as a lot of my coworkers did who had things like uh, – they, they had a lot more stock They in, and they wanted to – they thought they were going to be millionaires. Mm-hmm. Because they had options, they had this and that. I I never got into the options game. I never never had much of nothing there. But – I believe I got this from the Canadian capitalist or someone. You can't, you're already far too invested in your employer. If you're getting stock from them, if you're getting all this other stuff from them, you better dive, get out of their business. You're getting paid by them. In my case, I got a pension from Nortel as well. I should have had none of their stock or very little of it. Now, luckily, I ended up selling a lot of it along the way to pay off bills, pay for cars, but... You can't put all your all your eggs in your employer's basket. You've got to be much more diverse. Yeah, and that's a, a good advice in general. So you ask people, so tell me what's on your personal balance sheet. Well, I own a house. Yeah. End of story. So I don't have anything in an RSP, an RESP, a TFSA, anything like that. I own a house and I got a lot of debt. Well, that was, is having all your eggs in, in one basket as well. So... I uh, totally agree with that. That sounds uh, uh, sounds like obvious advice. So you lose the job. Obviously, you got to find another one. Right. So give me some tips on, you know, looking for a job. Everyone you meet is someone you can network with. Talk to them and say, well, you know, are there jobs at your place? Now, the danger you have is that when you get unemployed, you end up hanging out with other unemployed people because you'll go to services and things like that. I was lucky enough to have a, a fairly good service. But when you're talking with other unemployed people, that's not networking. That's commiserating. Mm -hmm. You need to talk to people who have jobs who will be able to say, yeah, we've got jobs here. Or no, I've heard from Bob that he's got jobs over there. And when you start looking for jobs and you've got your resume ready, remember what your social media is. This is your references. Facebook, every tweet you've put out there, every employer is going to look at this now. Now, when I was looking for jobs back in 2008, not as much. Not so much. A t- Twitter wasn't a thing back then. But all of those crazy things you've done in your life, all the weird pictures that are on Facebook when you were down in God knows where, and you know, there's a funny picture of that, your employers are going to look at that. So I'm just going to pause the tape and delete all my tweets right now. We'll be, well, back, yeah, in, we'll I, be back in five hours as we Yeah, as we I'm, do I'm that. lucky in that 
I'm close enough to retirement now that I think more likely than not they just say, "Can you just go away?" Yeah. Here, here's a retirement package. But it's that's much better advice for a millennial who's you know 30 years old and has lived through the the social media age the whole time and does have that whole online history. You know, you and I, while we're in our 50s, you know, perhaps not so much, but every, everything is a potential reference. So. Um, you know, always be networking. You you hit on that. What else in terms of, you know, looking for a job? Everyone's a potential source. What are the other places that you would you would be looking? What else would you be doing? If you go to a job fair, please don't wear flip flops. Don't wear flip flops. That might be the title for this episode. So yeah, it, it, now you're you're giving me an exaggerated example. No, I'm not. You're no, not. I, I've been to job. Fairs. Nobody's going to go to a job fair wearing flip flops. And you you think, oh, I'm just talking about. You know, young ladies and things. No, no. I've had people walk in with flip flops and their flash t shirts at job interviews. And you go, okay, I, I dig the fact that I work in technology and I understand free spirits are out there. I got no problem with this kind of stuff. If we're going to keep you in the back, that's fine. But first impressions are amazing things. If you're going to a job interview, don't cut anybody off. You know, if you're taking the bus, give up your seat. You never know who is going to end up interviewing you. And that has happened to me more times than not where I've walked into situations and I'm going, oh, look, who's interviewing me? The guy who I called a so-and-so, so-and-so. Yep. Boy, this is going to go really, really well. Yep. I hope he likes my spunk. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> might, indeed. Might not be the answer. But, well, and, and you've actually seen people wearing flip-flops to job fairs and job interviews. And, I mean, I can tell you a similar story of a – you know, muckety-muck reception where somebody was dressed the same way. I mean, do you not know who you're here to meet? Do you not understand the big picture? I And I realize, you know, that we're old farts, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, my father told me, you know, you, you dress well and all that. And, you know, first impressions are lasting impressions. And unfortunately, that's one of my few skills I have in life is my first impressions of people after I give usually, you know, your 10 or 15 seconds is right most of the time, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. You know, if I'm seeing you walking in with flip-flops on and you've got a look on your face of I don't want to be here, well, that, that you know, those of the 4,000 resumes I got, that one was easy to deal with because that went into the shredder before it even yeah. got on my desk. Yeah, don't count yourself out right at the start. That doesn't Well, yeah, doesn't make it, it any don't, sense. don't do things like that. Just, you know, you're, you're applying for a job. You're trying to convince these people that they want to hire you. And in my case, you know, I'm an older guy, and I I got interviewed by people that were 15 years younger than me. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to convince them that they want to hire me. Well, then they're going, well, why would I want to hire an old fart like you? Yep. You've got to convince them, you know, you've got skills that they want. Make sure the skills are well highlighted, and, you know, you can get that point across as opposed to me who, you know— yeah, and and the age thing is interesting because in some cases being old is a disadvantage— but in other cases, being old is an advantage. You got to find your spots. Like if you're going to get a job working at the LCBO, you know you can't be 16 years old. And in fact, for a job like that, yeah, probably the older you are, within reason, the better. Okay, you're dealing with a you know sensitive product here, and and so it, it becomes more of a thing. And that's just a, an example off the top of my head. But you got to play to your strengths, right? Exactly. And so if experience is, you know, I'm old, no, that means you're experienced. Go for the job that, you know, we're well, experienced. Especially where management. I am right now with project management. It, having a broad understanding of all parts of the project and then being able to say, when someone says, okay, well, here's, here's the project plan, and you go, okay, here, 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 and here are all areas of risk. Where's the risk plan for that? And they're going, oh, well, I didn't think of those as risks. And you're going, well, okay, these are the things that can go wrong. And they're going, well, how do you know that? Because I'm old. I've yeah, been exactly. Through it. 25 I've years it. I've gone through this. And, you know, we, you know, because of some toad, we couldn't put a cement pad over there because someone said you couldn't. So you lost six months with that. Well, you know, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. And that's where experience really comes in. So, Very much so. Um, Okay, so what other what other tips have you got then? Um, I mean, normally what we do at the end of the podcast is we go through all the practical advice, but we're just going to do the whole thing as practical advice here today. So any other tips that you've got for people who've either been through a layoff or are going through a, a job search? Well, it feels like hell. Uh, like I was actually out of work for 11 months. Wow. And I was lucky enough that I actually got severance from Nortel. Like I, I was in the last group that actually got paid out or had the potential to be paid out. 
uh, the people who got laid off to, after me are still fighting to get five cents on the dollar on things. So it's it feels like crap. It's not easy to do, but you got to get up in the morning and you got to do something every single day. You got to look for the jobs and you can't let yourself go. Jobs are out there. I mean, the millennials in some ways are luckier in a weird way because they've got three part-time jobs. They mm -hmm. get laid off from one, they've got two part-time jobs. But then they got to try to find a job when they've got two jobs to already take care of. So, I mean, the job hunt now, I don't know if I'm completely in tune with it because I'm I'm eight or nine years out of it. No, and, and the comment you made about millennials is exactly right because I know tons of them who are in exactly that situation. I was talking yeah. to one last week and it's like, well, you know, I'm lucky because each of those three jobs is flexible because, you know, one of them's in retail. So I'm working in the evenings. One of them's a, a you know, an office job, which is more during the day. One of them I do on the weekends. And so you're right. In one sense, they're protected because, well, if you lose one job, you've only lost one third of your income. But it's not a great life having three jobs, having to bounce from one to the other, trying to coordinate schedules. I, I do a four-hour shift from 5 a.m. till 9 a.m. in the morning. I got to take a bus across town. I go back home, sleep for two hours, get back on another bus for an hour, and do another four-hour shift somewhere else. It's, uh, it's not an easy life. But I think you know, the, the, the main point is you've got to be looking ahead and – at some point, things will change. You want to be ready for it. Is that the yeah. the pretty simple summary of it? Yeah, and I mean, at the end of it all, when you reach our age, or at least, I don't, I don't know if you have the same level of cynicism as I do, but I mean, I, I posted this tweet a couple of weeks ago. And it's a bad line, but it, I mean, I started off wanting a career. It ended up all I really wanted was a regular paycheck, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, when I was younger, I was thinking, oh, you know, go, going up here, I'm going to become a manager. I'm going to do this and that. Yeah, you know, it was kind of fun. I, mean, I worked with some amazing people. I had a great time, but holy cow, at the end of it all, it really was the paycheck you wanted. Mm -hmm. um, finding the jobs, it's not easy, but you got to be prepared and you got to be ready. And it can happen at any moment. Like, you don't know what you're going to find out tomorrow morning. And I, not not to be used too many scare tactics, but especially with the millennials, how you deal with having in part-time jobs to put together you know, the one full-time job you have. How you look for a job when you have other things going on in your life is not an easy thing. No, so. it's it's definitely difficult. So I want to morph into the final topic, which is a little bit more about um, your website and what you've done with it. So obviously, you, you know, you no longer work for Nortel. You've, you've mentioned that you're now uh, working for the government. You've reinvented yourself. Uh, you've got the, the big website now, you know, which I think has a hundred million views a huge, day, I believe is, is what it gets. So at when did, so it's the Canadian personal finance blog. When did you start that? I started that the month after my son was born in 2005. So now, do we have the internet then? I'm just trying to think back. That uh, far, well, I think so. Uh, it wasn't that long before that uh, the World Wide Web had been uh, born. It was, was just invented, and you uh, and you came up with a with a blog. So people know you as the Big Cajun Man, right? What's, that, it, what's the deal on that? Uh, that that was a rude uh, turn of phrase that I was at a golf uh, playing golf with a few friends and some cohort, a friend of came by and saw me wearing some silly straw hat. And he said, what does that idiot think he is? Some kind of big Cajun man. So it's an insult. And now it's become your, uh, yeah, your second name. Yeah, it got stuck to me by my friends. I, I have some wonderful friends. That Excellent. Way. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Why, why not then? So, so give us the overview of uh, what's on the, the blog. A lot of do as I say, not as I do advice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, after having... Three kids go through university using the RESP program, having a son that's on the autism spectrum, dealing with the RDSP program, investing, going through a layoff, which happened three years after I started the blog. So there's a whole hmm. bunch of really raw yep. posts about getting laid off that I've left as intact because it's, it's interesting for me to read as much as anything else. And in some ways, this is sort of an open letter to my kids saying, you see all these crazy things I did? don't do that or yes, do this. Mm -hmm. And if anybody else gets some stuff out of it, I really want to help the people with this, the disability savings plans and things like that because there's so many people out there that are trying to make an extra buck off them. And 
I, I just can't stand that. Well, and I think that's an excellent topic. So I'm going to ask you back and we're going to talk about our DSPs. Um, and because we've never discussed that before on the show. So what you're saying is the blog and, and how many posts do you have on it? About 3,000. 3,000. So if someone uh, has a few months to kill, then you've got, you got lots of time. But it's organized in such a way that if what I'm really interested in is, you know, RESPs or RDSPs or, you know, getting laid off or whatever, I can click the button, find that tag, and, and read those posts. Yeah. It, for most of it. It's still a bit ragtag in spots. I've got to work on the searching. I always mean to do things about it. But once you have 2,500 or 2,700 posts, you start going back over them and you start deleting a lot mm-hmm. because you go, what the heck yeah, was I wrong written about that? that. Yeah. But I, I used to write like every day, five days a week, and then sometimes on the weekend. And you end up building this huge backlog that I've been spending a lot of time just re- – like I I haven't really been posting that much lately. And it's it's because I've been going back and cleaning things up. And a lot of that is appearing now on the, on my Twitter feed. You'll see a lot of my best of and older stuff. It's advice to help you out. It's the things I've done. There are some really smart people about investing. There are some really, you know, you're great about bankruptcy trusteeship. Uh, the blunt bean counter will give you accounting stuff up the wazoo. And he has helped me out tremendously with, a, with the RDSP and a few other things. I'm not going to give you that kind of advice because I'm not that kind of expert. I'm just the, the Joe on the street kind of guy who's gone through a hell of a lot of interesting stuff. And I'll, I'll usually say, I have no idea what I'm talking about here. And I'll ask for advice. And it's surprising. I've got some really smart readers who've replied back going, hey, dummy, you're doing it the wrong way. Yeah, some of the great. comments on the blog are, are just as good as the article itself. Exactly. As they, as they chime in. I like it when people put in comments. Like one of my RDSP posts has like, I don't know, 250 different comments from people just saying, I can't get it done. How do I do this? And we usually try to help them out. My wife does a lot of work with me on the RDSP side of things. So, I mean, the blog itself is, 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 uh, it's not a business, really. I, I'd love to make millions of dollars like I am right now. Yes, of course, of course. We assume but, you're making a million dollars a week on it. So, Oh, absolutely. But it, it, is, it so, is what it is. So why don't you just sell out? I mean, you could, you could put uh, – you got all these posts about all these different things. Go to whatever the biggest RESP company is or RDSP company or, or whatever and say, hey, I got this blog. It's been going for years and years and years. It's got 3,000 posts on it. Tons of people read it. Um, I'll just put whatever you want on it. Give me, you know, a few million bucks and off we go. Yeah, I really couldn't wake up in the morning and look at myself after that. You know, I'm, I, I already joke about the fact that I'm a six-figure blogger. I, I make enough money in my job to do my jo- to do this. Uh, I, I want to help people with this stuff. And there's a lot of people that need help with this kind of stuff. I mean, you, you've dealt with enough people on the debt side of things. All, all my debt stuff ends up being relatively straightforward answering. You, you get to deal with the real grungy part of things there are enough people out there who are media savvy and understand how this all works and are going to really blind you with some really good stuff i'm just going to write with you what i can i mean it's not it's not always going to be the best writing i'm trying to fix a lot of that i've actually when you have three thousand posts there's a lot of rewrite you do yeah well, and but I think you raise a very good point, and that is there are many different sources. So you mentioned the the Blunt Bean Counter, who I believe is a chartered accountant. Um, he's a he's a partner at a, a partner at a big uh, firm or wherever, and so obviously he's got a lot of really good technical advice, um, and so obviously you need people like that. Um, I hope that's why people come to 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 see what I do as well. Your advice is from actually being out there and doing it. Yeah, and I mean, having four kids is is an, uh, been an amazing thing in my life. But you learn a lot of stuff about the importance of vasectomies. Yeah, well, too late now. But uh, well, I already had one, and that didn't work, oh, which explains my son. Oh. One of these days, I'm going to actually put that post <laughs> up there. But yeah, no, no, Reese yeah. appeared two excellent. years after my first Ex- vasectomy. Excellent. The excellent. second one worked a lot better. There you go. There you go. So, well, so you've lived life then, is what yeah. uh, exactly what you're saying? And it's a slice of life at times. Uh, no pun intended. Yeah, ooh, ooh. painful one anyway. Ooh, ooh. But it, it will. I'd like to be able to put a lot more expertise, a lot more polish on these things. Uh, but 
it's not really what I, I do, and it's not my expertise. My expertise is just sort of getting stuff out there and having people argue about it. Yeah, well, and that, but that's, that's how you learn, is by, you learn by doing it. So, so, okay, so how can people find you then? The, where is the blog? HTTPS colon. Ooh, it's S now. Oh, yes, I just, I just kicked it over to wow, S, so I've okay. lost a whole bunch of there readers because <laughs> Google's wiped me out of Absolutely. their indexes. Yep. So slash slash Canadian and the C-A-N-A-J-U-N finances, finances.com. So it, it is, it sort of went with big Cajun man. Tom Drake already had Canadian finances at the time. So I went, all right, well, I'll call it Canadian finances and thought it was hilarious. And of course, no one finds it now, (laughs) but you can look for some of my, you know, a lot of my posts. If you just do a, a search for, you know, like five steps to an RDSP, you'll find one of my posts on that. Uh, I'm out there. And how can people find you on Twitter? Uh, so there's at Big Cajun Man is, is the actual Twitter feed out there. I'm on Facebook as well. There's a Canadian personal finance place page on Facebook. I'm on pretty much every single social media. So if I actually tried to wipe myself off social media, Couldn't I'd be spending it. about four or five months. MySpace? you got a MySpace page. I had a MySpace page. <laughs> I'm old enough to know what that means. Having little dancing bananas on everything. It was fantastic. All the millennials are going, what, is that like GeoCities? Yep, yep, yes. same thing. GeoCities and, and those little torches you had on your yeah, pages, that was, that was fantastic. That was awesome. So, well, excellent. I think I think that's great. And as I said, there's a ton of stuff on there. If you want to get into an issue from the point of view of someone who's been through it, and yeah. we, we walked you through a, a whole bunch of the things that were on the on the blog now, then that's a fantastic way to do it. So, uh, Alan, thanks very much for being here. Well, thank you. Definitely appreciate it. So I'll put full links to the Canadian Personal Finance blog in the show notes, but again, it's at canadianfinances.com, C-A-N-A-J-U-N. See, it is pretty funny, canadianfinances.com. Full show notes, links, and a full transcript can be found at hoys.com. That is, of course, H-O-Y-E-S.com. That's our show for today. I'm Doug Hoyes. Thanks for listening. Until next week, that was Debt Free in 30.